was on a tow board, and you can tell because he's in the wave so much earlier than the wave breaking behind him, and he's kind of going really fast and skipping across. And when you're on a tow board, you get towed in by a jet ski, and you're on a really small board, and then it shows him switching back to a big board. I thought that was interesting. They kind of switch in and out of that. Hey GQ, I'm John John Florence, and this is The Breakdown. First up, forgetting Sarah Marshall. His timing for catching the wave wasn't too bad. It looks like someone learning to surf on a pretty small wave until the point when they just showed the other wave that was like three times the size of the wave that he was on. So they definitely switched waves there, but that's actually not far off of like someone learning to surf, taking off on a wave and running someone else over. In certain areas where people are learning to surf, that definitely happens often. There's definitely ways to avoid running other people over. And that's just going to where there's less people and going to places is where the waves are fit like more your talent level. In Hawaii, we have a place called Waikiki where a lot of people learn to surf when it's smaller. It's on the south side and the waves are really, really weak and you can kind of just go straight. When you're learning to surf, you ride a really big board. Bigger boards are harder to control, especially if you don't know how to surf. Long boards are the best boards for beginners to use because they're just bigger, they have more of an area and they're easier to, easier to stand on. It's kind of more of a platform so that the board kind of directs where they're going and they have no control over where it's going. That's another thing um, is he stands up go what we call goofy footed where your right leg is forward on the board. On the next clip, all of a sudden he's going the other way, which we call regular foot, where your left leg is forward on the board. Unless he got really good and he's switching stance all of a sudden, I, I don't think that's what happened. There's definitely kind of a... Uh, <laughs> I guess unwritten rules in the ocean among everyone kind of surfing, especially at certain places, you know, where there's a lot of localism and things like that. You know, some people have more priority over other people. At home, one of the most famous waves in the world is Pipeline. So many people out there, and it's one of the biggest kind of scariest waves in Hawaii. When you're out there, the people that have kind of been surfing there the longest kind of have the most priority. So. There's um, the Ho brothers, which is Derek and Michael Ho, who have been surfing out there for, you know, the past 30 years or so, maybe more. They have the most respect out of anyone. And so if they go for a wave, like everyone just stops and, and they get to go on the wave. And it kind of trickles down like that through the generations, all the way to my brothers and I, you know? And so like to the generation above us, like we, we try to stay out of their way and, and so on. But then other places in the world, if you just show up somewhere in the world, for the most part, it's if, you know, whoever's been waiting the longest gets the next wave. If someone was unconscious in the water like that, it would probably be a much bigger scene. With that many people around, it wouldn't just be one person carrying them up on the beach. Especially in Hawaii, it's like a really big thing. If someone is unconscious, then the, there's the lifeguards and jet ski, and there's a lot of people kind of coming in to help. It wouldn't just be the one person kind of diving underwater looking for him. Oh, wow, you got coral right there in your leg. Could, can you call the front desk for me, please? I don't think that's the first place you would call if you had a big cut like that is the front desk. <laughs> You'd definitely be calling the lifeguards or probably anywhere but the front desk. <laughs> Coral injuries are pretty common. Maybe not so much in Hawaii. Well, you have like a big piece of almost live coral sticking out of your leg like that. But in other places in the world, like Tahiti and Fiji, places like that will have live coral on the reef. And so that, that's possible. I've never had anything this bad where there's a big piece of coral sticking out of my leg, but throughout my life, I've definitely hit the bottom and had pretty bad cuts. Next up, Blue Crush. Rock running is actually kind of a thing. When you're holding your breath and kind of running at the same time, it replicates surfing and getting worked by the wave because you're holding your breath and while trying to swim up to the surface at the same time. There's a couple of really good places in Hawaii where this was filmed to go do that. You know, you go down and you just pretty much hug a big rock and then can run on the bottom. Yeah. 
we don't normally have people trailing us when we're rock running. It's more of a thing you do just for fun. I don't do it as a main part of my training and I definitely wouldn't have a trail of people pulling on me. All the different waves in the world have different bottoms to them. And so the bottom of say, Waimea Bay in Hawaii is partially like big stones and then some of it is sand. Whereas if you go to Pipeline, which is in Hawaii also, it's a lot of really big kind of reef caves, very different looking than that underwater. If it's sand like that, it, the just from the constant movement of the water, it creates this perfect little form of waves in the sand on the bottom. You could have stayed down longer than that. I'm tired of holding my breath in. Breath training is really important as a surfer, especially as a big wave surfer, because you get caught in situations where holding your breath is your key to survival. And when you're under that amount of stress, when you're paddling and a big wave is breaking in front of you, your heart rate's really going pretty quick and holding your breath with your heart rate high like that is really hard to do. Next up, point break. We definitely surf in storms, but I don't think you're surfing in a storm like this on a boat by yourself somewhere in the ocean about to jump off and tie the steering wheel of the boat. That wave is um, like 100 feet compared to the boat. It's definitely so far from reality. We call it step offs. We usually do it with jet skis. And so you'll jump off the side of the jet ski onto a wave like that and kind of paddle into the wave. I don't think it's possible to do it on that size of a boat, especially by yourself with no one driving the boat into a wave that big. When the waves are big like that, they're moving incredibly fast. So in the movies, the waves look like they're in slow motion. In reality, it's it just depends on the size of the wave, I guess. When the waves are really, really big, like when it's as big as it gets, it's so big that it looks like it's moving in slow motion, actually. Like just there's so much water moving. There's some waves in the world that are pretty far out there in the, in the middle of nowhere. There's a wave off of California that's, I think it's 100 miles out or so off the coast. That wave is pretty extreme, but you're taking like a big boat out there. But for the most part, the waves are really relatively close to the shore. So I think this is actually goes into a real surfing clip from Jaws. And yeah, people do this. I mean, my brother spends every swell at where this wave was filmed. It's amazing what some of the guys do out there. They really push the limit of our sport kind of in these big waves. Jaws or uh, Piahi, it's called, is a place on Maui in Hawaii and it's on the North Shore of Maui. And so it's probably one of the most perfect big waves in the, in the whole world. There's not really anything else like it. He was on a tow board and you can tell because he's in the wave so much earlier than the wave breaking behind him and he's kind of going really fast and skipping across and when you're on a tow board you get towed in by a jet ski and you're on a really small board and then it shows him switching back to a big board i thought that was interesting they kind of switch in and out of that when you're surfing big waves it's really scary when you're watching it and it's scary to think about going on the wave. So when you're sitting there in the position to go on a wave, your heart rate's going and a set is coming. You're getting ready to like, okay, this is the one I'm gonna go on this. I know that I sit there and I have to like work up into going on a wave, like sitting in the lineup for a second, getting comfortable with it, seeing the bigger sets come in and then finally working myself up to go on a wave. Next up, Orange County. Dude, bro, there's a tropical storm three miles off the gunnel. Let's go, dude, surf's up. What about next period? 20 footers, man, screw your period. I don't think I've ever brought my surfboard to school and I don't know anyone who has. But skipping school to go surfing was definitely <laughs> something I did when I was younger. I don't know you guys. Dude, 
face the fear. I don't think anyone's rushing out of high school to go surf 20 foot waves like that. Usually when people are surfing 20 foot waves, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it and a lot of safety kind of revolving around that. I think those boards are meant for learning to start paddling on maybe and maybe start to learn to stand up, but definitely not to go surf 20 foot waves. Righteous. That's maybe the biggest wave I've ever seen. Waves like this exist, but waves like this uh, aren't very often. And usually when people are surfing them, there's jet skis and all kinds of stuff going on. You're not just paddling out from the beach and going by yourself like that. In Southern California, the waves do not get that big either. Southern California gets some really big storms, but it will never look like this. I don't think he should approach it like that. People kind of get caught in that position quite often when it's really big, but it's not really the position you want to be in. If you're in that position, you're usually at this point diving off your board and taking your leash off of your foot and letting your board go and trying to get through the wave to the other side. Next up, chasing Mavericks. Mavericks is a wave in Northern California. It just holds some of the biggest swell. The water's brown, it's really cold, and it's dark, and it's scary. It's a really challenging wave to surf and a big part of kind of our surf world. A lot of people dedicate their lives to surfing that. There's a lot of history in big wave surfing there. And even still to this day, people get some of the best rides in big waves surfing out there. Jumping off into a wave like that as well, you kind of wait for a wave to come and it puts more water under you. And usually you're jumping off trying to land kind of right on the back of the wave, timing it like that. This just allows you to be in the lineup really quickly without having to paddle out through the waves. We kind of call it like a air reverse because you're doing an air and you're landing and then kind of reversing around. This is a pretty standard maneuver in surfing now. You'll see a lot of the young kids doing it. It's like their first kind of aerial maneuver. It, it seems like the easier one to go to. This is also one that you see in competition a lot. I spent a lot of time there when I was younger doing contests. He's taking off right next to the cliff. Oh, you can see all that kind of wobble, all the, the bump in the wave there. That's kind of all the refractions that come off the cliff as the waves go by. And it makes it a really challenging wave to surf. Next up, Lilo and Stitch. Some of this is sort of realistic, you know, like I think growing up in Hawaii is kind of similar in the sense of like going surfing with your friends and family. It just it does it. It makes you feel good. It makes you happy. And there's turtles and things like that for sure. But going into the air with someone on your board, maybe not so realistic. <laughs> Most people can ride on a board at once and it's kind of a fun thing you do. Call it tandem surfing. Yeah, that's totally possible. <music> Hawaii can have really clear water sometimes. Almost exactly like that to where you're surfing and there's, you'll see a turtle or you'll see fish. It can be really clear, crystal clear, like a swimming pool. <music> There's definitely reasons why we, when we're getting into the barrel, we put our hand in the wave. A lot of the time it's to slow down because once you're in, in there, you get a lot of speed and it really starts pushing you through it. And kind of the goal is to always to stay in there as long as you can. Another thing sometimes too is when you're just in there, you kind of just naturally do that, I guess, for feel. I guess it is. Um, not really thinking about it though. <laughs> I think the idea behind Lilo and Stitch is good. Going surfing and relieving stress and being out there with friends and family. Some of the surfing was probably a little bit unrealistic and getting waves like that with that many people on a board. I don't know if you could do that on a wave that big. Next up, surf's up. Final wave. Go, man. This is it. This wave wins it, huh? Yeah, man. Woo. This wave is stacking up to be a beautiful tube. 
You wouldn't have multiple surfers on one wave. You could if one person was going one way and the other person was going the other way. So there's a priority system within competition. And so the person that has priority gets to choose which way they want to go on that wave. And if the other person interferes with them at all, that's when you get a penalty. They'll take away half of your score or a whole score. <laughs> At a really small level, some of this does happen. Sometimes you're on a wave and you're kind of going around rocks and maybe surfing with someone else, but you could imagine it like a video game, what you would do in a surfing video game, like dodging rocks and being with kind of other people on the wave like that. <laughs> Breaking boards happens quite a bit. And I think every surfer goes through like different phases of it, you know, and sometimes You'll break a lot of boards and sometimes you won't break any for a couple months, but definitely have gone through winters at home where I've broken 30 or 40 boards. I think you would die if that happened. And you know, the lifeguards, I think around the world in, in Hawaii, they have these kind of big yellow boards and they're, they'll, they'll paddle those out to get a surfer. I think depending on the wave size though, and for the most part though, the lifeguards have jet skis now, and so they can launch the jet ski within minutes and be in the water and go out and save someone. Let the wave carry you, Cody! Stay! Ah! I don't know that letting the wave carry you and someone catching you, <laughs> that's pretty unrealistic, but the part of like sitting behind a rock kind of on, when a wave comes, maybe not on such a big scale, but on like a much smaller scale, it's kind of something like we even do at home for fun is like there's there's a big rock by my house that's on the beach and you can run and uh, stand behind it and the waves will kind of hit it and go way over you and you'll be totally fine behind the rock. Thanks for watching these clips with me and we'll see you next time.